Hello and welcome to this Power Designer demonstration. Today's topic is on building a simple physical data model with Power Designer. People who are new to Power Designer sometimes struggle with just how to get started. And if that describes you, then this video will help you immensely. Today we'll look at creating a new physical data model, adding tables to that model, creating columns for those tables, creating a reference between the tables, and then finally generating the DDL file to use in your SQL editor. So let's get started by creating a new physical data model. There are a number of different ways to do this. You can use a menu or you can use a button. For this example, we'll use the button. As you can see, there are a number of different model types that you can create in Power Designer. Today's topic is focused on creating a physical data model, so that's the model type we'll choose. Now at this point, we have to give the model a name and pick a database target since it is a physical data model. There are a number of different databases supported by Power Designer. For this example, I think we'll just stick with Microsoft SQL Server. Over on your left hand side is the workspace. The workspace contains all the metadata about your model and the diagrams that visualize that metadata. Once we start creating objects in the model, this area will be populated with the metadata. For now, let's just give the default diagram some meaningful name. Now we're ready to start adding tables. On the right hand side is the toolbox. This area contains all the tools needed to build a physical data model. Let's select the table tool and add a couple of tables. Once a tool has been activated, it remains active until you choose another tool. To return back to the pointer arrow, you can click it in the toolbox, or here's a good shortcut. Just right click in a blank area of the model, and the tool will be reset back to the pointer. When we create new objects in Power Designer, they're given generic names followed by a numeric suffix. These are placeholder names. Let's edit the tables and add some more specific names. Since this is a model about employees and departments, let's modify the names to reflect that. Edits always take place on a property sheet, so one way to get to the property sheet is to simply double click the object. Before we begin our edits here, let's take a minute to talk about name and code. A name is a business term that identifies an object based on the business. Code is a technical term that identifies an object to a system. The important thing to know about name and code is that code is always used when generating DDL for a database. Name is merely a documentation artifact that's relevant to business. The default behavior is to mirror the name in the code field. So you can modify either one at any time. For more details on this topic, see the video on naming conventions. Right now, let's add both a business name and technical code. The comments field can be used for definitions or anything else you think might be important to note. Notice that the workspace now has a tables folder and two tables in it. We looked at one method to get a property sheet. Now let's take a look at another method. In the workspace, you can right click on any metadata and choose properties and it'll get you to the property sheet. Let's add the name department to this table. We now have two tables, one defined as employee and one defined as department. Now let's add a series of columns to each table and what we'll do is we'll use the right mouse button to get the properties list for the columns. This property sheet looks a little bit different from the one we use to define a table. This is a grid type property sheet. You'll see this property sheet whenever you work with more than one of the same object type. In this case, we have an object type of column and we're going to insert more than one of them. The headings along the top indicate the properties that we can modify. These headings can be changed, filtered, and sorted as well. In the upper left-hand corner of this property sheet, there's a series of buttons. 
We'll use these buttons to add rows to this grid. So let's get started by adding the first column. Remember in our previous example where we defined a table with a name and then a code to replace the generic placeholder? Well, you follow the same workflow here. Well, we've got our first column, so let's add several more. Just continue to click the button and you can add more rows to the property sheet. But here's a quick tip. You can also use the down arrow key on your keyboard to quickly advance to the next row without having to go back up and click a button. It's a little bit faster. Well, that was pretty quick, except I forgot one thing. I needed to add title to this list. Now, I could just add it at the bottom, but it would be a little bit more readable if I inserted it before the first name. I'm going to use the Insert button to insert a new row, and then I can put title in it. Now we need to add the data types to the columns. There are two ways to add a data type. You can use a drop-down list or you can use the standard data types window. We'll use the window first. Just select the appropriate radio button to enable your choice. Now let's try it with the drop-down list method. At any time you can always go back to the single object property sheet. Just click the row and then click the Properties button. Now this looks more like the property sheet we use for tables. I think you'll find that entering information for a series this way might be a little bit slower. I think you'll find using the grid a lot quicker. Let me point out some of the time-saving advantages of using the grid. Let's suppose that you want to make some bulk edits on columns and assign the same value to multiple columns without having to manually do it one object at a time. Simply select the columns you want by clicking on the row header number. You can use the shift or control keys as modifiers. So a shift key will allow you to select multiple contiguous rows and the control key will select multiple non-contiguous rows. Then simply make your modification, and they'll apply to all the rows selected. Here we'll add a data type and set the length for both the first and last names. Just a side note here, the standard data types window does not work in this particular method, so you have to use the drop-down list. Here's a good opportunity to point out my favorite feature in Power Designer, which is the undo feature. Here I inadvertently clicked in the wrong cell and got some unexpected results. I'll simply use the undo menu item to start over again. Now that's more like it. See how I can make multiple edits to multiple objects without repetitious cycles? This is a huge time saver. We'll click the Apply button to accept these changes. Let's finish up by defining the data type for the Notes column. Our example model here only has two tables in it, but you may have a very large model with many tables in it and it might take some time to scroll around and find the exact table that you want to get the properties on. So a faster way to do this is to use the metadata in the workspace. Simply right click on the object and choose the property sheet. The metadata in the workspace is a lot more organized than model graphics are. Let's fill out the column properties for this table the same way we did for the last table. Now here's a situation where I want to use a column that I've already defined in another table. So what I'm going to do here is use the Add button to give me a list of all the available columns, and then I'll pick the ones that I want to use in this table. In this case, I want to take the Notes column that I already defined for an employee and use it in the Department table. So here you can see I now have the Notes column in the Department table. This is another big time saver for Power Designer. Um, let's finish up by defining data types for the previous two columns.
Now that the columns have been defined, let's assign the primary key. Now if you look in the grid control, you notice off to the right there are a series of checkboxes with an individual letter at the top of the column, a P and a D, etc. The P represents primary, and if we place a checkbox in that column, then that will make it the primary key. And if we're not sure, we just move our mouse pointer to the header and a yellow flag will come out and give us a hint that that is the primary key identifier. The model graphic shows an underlined column to depict that it's a primary key column. And as you've probably figured out in Power Designer, there's more than one way to do the same thing. So let's use the workspace method to assign a key for the employee table. So far we've defined the tables, then we define the columns that belong to each table, and then we've defined the primary key. Now we're ready to start adding a relationship between the tables. So the first thing that we need to do is to pick the relationship tool from the toolbox and then drag between the two tables to establish the connection. Now, before we do this, there's an important note. When you drag, you're always dragging from the child to the parent. That will migrate your primary key to become a foreign key in the child table. If you look very closely at the table in the graphic, you'll see that employee ID has migrated to the department table. You'll also see that a PK and FK symbol denotes the relationship. Now we're almost done. I want to take a step back for a minute and remember when I said that code is always used to define the DDL that Power Designer generates. Well, we're going to start the generation process, but before we do that, let's take a quick look through SQL Preview and see what I'm talking about. Now here we can see an example of the SQL that's being used to create the table called employee. Now if we look closely at the SQL statements, you'll notice that it's using EMP or EMP, but it's not using employee. Employee was the business term, but EMP was the code. And you can also see here at the column level that we've got an EMP underscore ID, but not employee ID. So that just verifies that the code is what Power Design will use to generate the SQL statements for your DDL. So let's go ahead and generate the script now. There's also a SQL Preview tab in this dialog box so that you can view the entire DDL script before you generate it. When the generation is complete, the output window will show you the status of the generation. In this case, it was successful. And the generated files window points to where the file is located so that you can point it to it and open it up with your SQL editor. So that concludes this demonstration on how to build a simple physical data model with Power Designer. Thanks for watching.